Hey to everyone uh, coming out today on this frosty morning. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Barton Stam. I'm with the University of Wyoming Extension. So I live in uh, Hot Springs County, uh, west of Thermopolis. We actually got a little bit of snow last night. About three quarters of an inch. It was a major whiteout for, <laughs> for this year. Um, anyway, happy to be here with you today. I uh, enjoy coming down to Farm and Ranch Days, and I'm happy to be out uh, doing stuff during these times of COVID-19. Um, so appreciate everyone coming. <clears throat> this isn't the greatest uh, topic to be to be talking about, and it seems like uh, we've definitely covered some of this stuff before. I'll tell you, um, before we really get started, I wish I had some real silver, silver bullets for you. Um, there really isn't a lot of great news when we're talking about grazing during a drought. Um, but we're kind of trying to work, work through a few things here and, and see, where, see where we can go. So we're just going to do a little, um, I had, I've been working with some permittees here and maybe some of you, how many, any folks here have some federal grazing allotments? A couple, okay. Well, we'll have to work it through this a little bit different angle because this was a part of what I was going to talk about, but this was a letter and actually I've, I fuzzed out the office, um, the, the BLM office that sent this out, but um, I work with some per, quite a few permittees, and the BLM has already sent out this letter to what I think is hundreds of permittees. Um, if you can't read it out, out there, it's talking about that they're looking forward to this coming grazing season, so the 2021 grazing season. And they're also talking about how the U.S. Drought Monitor, which we'll look at here in a second, is, is defining most of the lands in this BLM district as a um, D3 or an extreme drought with widespread pasture losses and water shortages. And then they also talk about residual forage. So 2020 was so bad and so dry that what they're referencing here is that a lot of producers or permittees grazed on 2019 forage that was still available in 2020. Was that anyone else's experience? Yep, okay. So, what I really like about this letter, a couple of things that I really like about that were sent out, was that the, the Warland the Warland BLM, I just messed it up, that's who sent this out, but it was another press article, I don't think they'll care too much. Um, the Warland BLM has already sent this out, you can see it was dated last month. They've already sent this out and they're asking producers to plan with them. And whether you're a grazing permittee on federal lands or you're grazing all on private lands, having a plan going into these droughts is probably the most critical thing you can do, is to have a plan about what you're gonna do and when you're gonna start implementing those plans. So that's one of the parts that I really like about this letter, is being prepared and, and going forward. So I'm gonna kinda bounce back and forth between some of these things in this letter and some and some other things. So I want to talk a little bit about the timing of precip. So we're already worried about a drought now in 2021. Okay, what are some of the things that are making you guys worried about precipitation or grazing or forage supply in 2021? That we're at 69% uh, soil, uh, what is it, soil equivalent. Soil water Snowpack, equivalent, yeah. yep, okay. So the snowpack. Okay. No fall moisture. No fall moisture. Okay. Bare ground. Okay. Bare ground is in not snow covered or not covered in vegetation. Uh, not snow covered. Not snow covered. Okay. How windy it's been. Windy. Okay. Um, when you say how windy it's been, do you mean like last summer, last spring, the whole last? Uh, all the time. All the time. <laughs> summer and okay. fall and dry and wind. All right. Moisture. Okay, and how come you didn't have any growth last year? Well, it was mostly the, the south side of the hill, but it was too dry. Okay, and are we I talking- didn't even get enough water in the spring. And are you talking about uh, rangeland or irrigated uh, land? Uh, sagebrush. Sa sagebrush land. Rangeland stuff, okay. The cheap grass took the spring off. How often does it do that? <laughs> <laughs> you, didn't even get, get, you didn't even get good cheap grass growth. Yeah. So the timing of the precept is really kind of an important um, function for us to think about. And I have a couple of different pictures up there. Now when we're talking about rangelands, 
the snow, the winter snow, how important is the winter snow for bringing up dry land, rangeland grasses? Not very important. Okay, how come? Well, if there's a frost in the ground, you don't get a lot from it. I mean, it might fill reservoirs, but it doesn't do anything. Okay, that's a great point. It fills reservoirs, like snowpack filled poison, another one. <laughs> Okay, what else? <coughs> and then, something also about it doesn't go into the ground. Where else, where does it go? Okay, so there's a process called sublimation. So that snow goes right from being a solid <coughs> water vapor into the atmosphere. And that's what's actually happening a lot right now to what little snow we've got. Okay, the picture there with the buffalo um, on it. How critical is to get precinct during that time of year? So we've got a buffalo calf, we've got a young green grass, how important is precip then? Very right? So that's almost like one of the most important times to get it. Maybe even a little bit earlier than that, I would say, are those real important times. So as we go in, as we move from winter into early spring, these coming, these next couple of months, so March and April, are really going to make or break us in terms of especially for rangeland forage production. So as you're moving ahead thinking about your, your grazing plan, and this matters whether you're on rangeland or even irrigated grasses, although if, you have, if you're um, either on a river, like a lot of folks in the basin are that they irrigate out of, um, <clears throat> or, or a, I guess it just depends on whether you're on the river or downstream of a reservoir, you've really got to pay attention to what the snowpack is doing, and then also what the how those, those spring rains and even those spring snows come. Because it's, we're talking about different supplies. So, of course, a melting snow bank into a rangeland grass scenario, that helps. You know, if you go over South Pass and you see those big snow banks, especially right down downwind of a, the snow fences, right, those make a, a small difference. But on a bigger scale with the rangeland, these next couple months of March and April are going to be absolutely critical for growing grass. And so if you have a drought plan ready to go, and we continue to be dry in March and April, then we really need to start thinking about what is our plan going to be moving forward. Now, if the, the snowpack a lot of times is going to come off later in the year and can fill those reservoirs or stock tanks, um, put water in the river and the irrigation canals, but, but you, can, you can watch those snowpacks and see what they're doing as well. So it pays to look at, to pay attention to those, okay? So um, if you go, if, if you're not familiar with the U.S. Drought Monitor, um, if you want to go to an internet search engine and just type in U.S. Drought Monitor, it'll, it'll be the first one that comes up. And you'll get a, so I've pulled up, you'll get the whole country when you do that, and then you can zoom in to, uh, more localized area for you. So I, of course, have Wyoming on here. So the red is what's titled the D3, or extreme drought, okay? And the so we're in Fremont County here, so it looks looking like maybe, I don't know, half, 40% of Fremont County is an extreme drought. How many of you agree with that? You think it should be more of Fremont County? Less? Okay. All. <laughs> All? Okay. So I've actually had, so one of our colleagues in, at the University of Wyoming has some, something to, more to do with this in the planning and the input, and I've been having some conversations with her because for me, now I work throughout western Wyoming, but especially in the northwest, you know, Fremont County and the Bighorn Basin, but for me, like, since I'm most familiar with Hot Springs County, like I'm with you with Fremont County, I think all of Hot Springs County ought to be in that, at least in that D3. And you know that you can have some influence over where these designations lie. And so I'll get to that in just a second, but this, this other one is the snow tail. So you mentioned the snow water equivalent. And so it's talking about that this Wind River Basin is at 70% of normal, what'd you say, 69? I think so. Yeah, two weeks in a row it's been at 69. Yeah, so you're real close, or they're real close to you. Um, so if you want to have some influence over the U.S. Drought Monitor, if you'll go to this uh, link here that I've got, it's called Drought Impacts, um, and then follow these next links, 
If you come up, if you search that first one, it'll, it'll bring this page up right here. And I'll tell you that this works a lot better if you don't use Internet Explorer. So when you're on the Internet, those Internet browsers, this works very poorly, if at all, in Internet Explorer. So use a different uh, browser. And then you can go to Condition Monitoring Observations, and you can submit your own report to help them get more data. Because a lot of times, they don't have enough uh, data points coming in to telling them how to designate the country in drought. To, so basically how to, how to move those colors around. So I'm just going to... Uh, put a couple screenshots up here so you can see what it looks like. So if you go to that first link, and then can, that'll be look like here, and then you, you can click on this one, it'll show you, and then you can click on this submit a report, and it's going to ask you for um, your experiences about what's going on, what's being impacted. It'll ask you your general location, how long you've been there how often you've seen the present conditions, and then it's gonna start asking you about different impacts. So these impacts will be like stream flow, forage production, impacts to crops, impacts to wildlife, um, impacts to uh, livestock, all those sorts of things. And if you can send those in, they will have more data points to be able to more accurately describe the drought situations on the ground. But if you carry a federal permit, So if this, this will have other, this will have benefits too to where um, with drought assistance and, 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 and other programs that way. And then if you're worried about your federal permit, I would say that something like this is, is going to influence that less because if you're, if you're really in that drought, then the range staff on that district is, I mean, they're going to know it and they're, they're going to be wanting to work with you anyway on it. But there's not enough drought assistance to cover us not going to the range this summer. No, I understand that it's not necessarily, um, it's not going to cover, cover you all, but what I'm saying is, is having those additional data points on there is not probably going to hurt you from the BLM or the Forest Service side, but it could help you from, from the other assistance side. I, if there's going to be a drought on the ground, the range staff's going to, I mean, they're going to be aware Okay, so I'm going to go back to this letter here, and we're going to talk about a few things. So we've talked about timing of precip. So am I ready to declare that the rangelands in Wyoming are going to have a drought this spring? No. I mean, no, not yet. Like, we still have time, right? But the, but the fact is that we are setting ourselves up into, kind of, I guess we're not doing this, the weather is setting us up for a scary situation where we're in a La Nina pattern. And if you think back to some of those droughts we had in the early 2000s and 2012, the patterns were very similar, right? We had these sort of dry, warm Januaries, and those snows didn't come. So I guess what I would be saying is to be extremely cautious right now with what's going to happen. Let's wait and see what, what March and April bring. But in any year, we need to be prepared for a drought, and especially in a year like this where we're in these La Nina patterns and we have these dry, open winters, okay? So not only are March and April real important for our spring precip, but there are also actually our real heavy snowpack, snowpack months, too, where most of our snow does have come. So we do have time, but it is getting scary. You had a... Yeah, I thought I'd heard from some of my weather friends that they're, they're hopeful or predicting that the La Nina might end in March and that we might have a change. Have you heard that? So I'm not a weatherman at all, but from what I've been listening from uh, Don Day, I, I haven't heard that. I haven't heard him say that at all. Okay. Um, and that's actually a pretty, I don't know how you feel about Don Day or what, but it's a pretty good information. I really like his uh, day weather podcast that he does every weekday morning. And so that's a, it's, if you're a weather nerd, or most of you guys are in ag or natural resources, so you'd probably be interested in it like I do, and it's only a few minutes long, and it's, it's got a lot of good information, but from what I've seen, the La Nina pattern is setting up to be pretty strong. I'm not a weatherman. I'm just relating what I've heard. I can't make forecasts on that. 
Um, so I really like that they're looking forward um, and wanting to work with these with with the with the permittees. So if you have a if you have a permit or you work with people who have a permit, one of the things that this letter is asking here is for people to come in and meet with their rangeland management specialist. Okay, to start uh, developing that plan. And for a lot of you, a meeting with the BLM might seem like that, right? <laughs> That's about as much fun as it is, okay? But I want you to know that I was out with a permittee in a range con last week, and this, that's a permittee and a range con in real life. I just took that picture last week. That's what the real meeting, I mean, I don't, you, you, you ought to go into the office and meet with them, but get out on the ground with them and talk about the scenarios that, that you have, okay? So this permit, we weren't talking about so much the upcoming drought. We were talking about some livestock distribution which I think, which is gonna be one of the main points that I wanna to talk to you about for grazing during the drought. So I really encourage you to get with your, uh, if, if you have a permit, to get with your rangeland management specialist. If you have to meet with them in the office, but get out on the ground, it may not be horseback, it might be just out of the pickup or whatever, but get out and do it. So some things here that, the, that this uh, office is talking about that they want to consider and they're saying in anticipation of the 2021 grazing year, they're going to continue to monitor range conditions. So that's what we've kind of been talking about, that we have these next couple years of March and April, especially for lower elevation BLM permits or private ground or state ground, whatever it might be. March, March and early April are going to be absolutely critical months as we go forward and monitor. Okay, so then they're going to talk to you about their, their specific situations. Um, and the things they're going to talk about are pasture rotation, duration of use, range readiness or deferred turnout, and other management flexibility options that they might have. So let's cover a few of these things. That, and these apply to, to private ground. They really apply to any grazing land. Um, but let's talk about some of these options. So pasture rotation. How are we going to think about pasture rotation? And let's throw in um, turnout days too. How are we going to think about that if we go into another grazing, uh, another drought here for this permit? For, for pasture readiness or range readiness. This is kind of one of those terms that we throw out like, is the pasture ready for us to graze, right? And we can have issues with, with that term and, and whether or not the pastures are ready to be grazed. I usually like to say it's not so much as the pasture ready to be grazed as, as you are a manager, are you ready to manage the grazing? But in a drought year, a lot of times, what happened last year in the drought? As far as timing and pastures being ready and mature? Some pastures really early. Really early, okay. So where I live, so I have a rain, a rain gauge where I live. I mean, it's right next to my house. And our best rain in Hot Springs County came the end of the first week in June. How much good did it do us? Like almost none, because the grasses were already, I mean, they were headed out and they had already done their thing. And instead of being you know, as tall as they should have been, they were like a third or, or maybe a little bit more of where they should have been. So really watch pasture readiness and it might come a lot earlier than you suspect during those grazing years. The other thing that we talk, that we talk about like with deferred turnouts, so deferred turnout would be going out maybe a lot later than you normally would. So if you're grazing later in the season, what happens with livestock distribution and water? What, what's the weather doing later in the season? It's hotter and drier, and the livestock do what? Scatter. And they, con they, they concentrate more and more around water, shade, those kinds of things. So if you're going for a delayed turnout, you really need to watch. That's one of the distribution things that you've got to watch. Um, okay, duration of use. This is a big one. When we're in when we're in a drought situation, what's happened to our forage supply? Decreased. Decreased, and it's expensive, right? Okay, so if you're leasing pasture or buying feeds, the supply is really what we're talking about. So the supply side of it is going to be way down. And there may be some real issues for duration of use on any pasture. 
whether it's your private land or on a federal permit, you might be you might be facing some severe cuts in duration of use. So management flexibility, you know, are you set up to have a plan with do I have alternative pastures to go to, which might be really tough? Do I have additional or um, alternate feeds that I can come up with, which might be really expensive? I think, now some of you guys might know more than me, but I think since our winter has been so open, there might be some additional feed supplies coming online. I don't think they're going to get any cheaper, but they might become a little bit more available towards the end of this winter because a lot of, a lot of people um, haven't had to feed near as much because the winter has been so open. But that's something to think about as we come out of this winter is looking forward to next year and are there some additional things that I need to think about in terms of purchasing feeds like now for later in the year? Um, do I need to do something with stocking rate on my farm or ranch? Just gonna check the time real quick. Okay. So this supply side is really what we're gonna be suffering from on the drought. Um, again, we, I cannot stress enough that growing season precipitation, that's the make it or break it for me in any year, is what was the growing season precipitation like? And I have seen, and I'm sure all of you have too, rangelands that have suffered severe drought recover extremely quickly the next year when they have those good growing season years. The other thing about, somebody earlier mentioned fall precip. So that's a really important time as well to look at. You know, are those late summer, early fall rains with the right uh, temperatures, you can get a nice shot of regrowth on your grasses. And it's another, it's another time to be really looking at the pressures that are, that are the grazing pressures that might be going on to your grasses that time of year. So we think about spring, but we also need to think about that late summer, early fall as well. So the residual forage, um, 18 and 19 were really pretty good years in terms of growing uh, forages. So are there places out there where you've got that residual forage that a lot of folks depend on? Now I've got up there places they don't eat. What am I meaning about here? And I mean not you guys, not the places you don't eat in, in town. <laughs> I'm talking about the livestock on the ranch. Okay, so we're talking about livestock distribution. If you're raising livestock, you have a distribution issue, okay? I'll just say it point blank. If you're raising livestock, you have a distribution issue. Why do you have a distribution issue? Water ruggedness. Okay, water ruggedness. That's what you're gonna see. Okay, what do they prefer? Why else are some reasons? Lazy cattle. Lazy cattle? <laughs> what are some other reasons? Water, terrain, lazy cattle, what they prefer to eat, uh, predators maybe, heat, wind, all those kinds of things. So really, to me, that's one of the bigger issues is livestock distribution, and so what are some ways we can fix that? So I'm gonna talk about just a couple here, and the BLM talked about it too when they talked in this letter, whoops, when they talked about uh, pasture rotation, right, that's gonna affect distribution, uh, range readiness, you know, if there's snow on the ground, that's all going to talk about it. Okay, so here's this, uh, I think I did an internet search and I typed in livestock distribution just to see what would come up, and I got this cool little cartoon that came up here, and so I, I've stolen it and put it on here. I think this was from um, a supplement manufacturer, which I really like the idea. So if you can't see it out here, this step one says, Place supplements close to the water and loafing areas. Okay? So we got the water and we've got the supplement here and there's a few head of cattle. And then it starts talking about moving it farther and farther away. And I think they've actually done a really good job with this little cartoon here. Okay? So then I've taken a couple pictures that I took in real life that I want to show. Um, I'm hoping you can't identify where this first one is. Uh, okay, so somebody tell me what is Brom. Can you guys see that picture? So there's, of course, the cattle. There's a salt block right here. And there's a. I was standing on the other side of a fence, so this was private property, so I couldn't get any closer than that. 
There's salt here, and then this is some kind of a supplement. I think it's a molasses uh, protein bl uh, block in there. Somebody critique that for me in terms of how it's being used. Sage rust is all beat up. Okay. Some of it is. Other of them are washed. Okay, so expand on that. The sage brush has been beat up. Is that good or bad? source from that angle. There, so there is there's actually water. Uh, it's a dirt tank, but there's some water pretty close to that. It's, you can't see it. Hmm. Okay. So when I'm hanging around there and you've got one dirt patch and nah, there's, yeah, nah, there's some grass behind where all the grass is back there. Okay, so when you say behind it, like do you mean tell me when to stop with my finger. Okay, so I really like these kind of tubs, and I'm sure the salesmen that sell these, I know the salesmen really like you guys to buy these. If you're buying these kind of, like those low moisture, those molasses lick tubs, so they're an expensive way to buy protein, right? They have some really nice advantages. This is like the worst way to use them. So in this scenario, what has this rancher done, as we've described, is they, they're, he, where has he taken that lick tub? Right next to the salt and next to the water. Okay. And, and, and in more general terms, in terms of the terrain, where else has he taken that? Salt. So you could, you, could drive, you could drive a semi to that location. Okay. That's how. You, I kind of really tried to narrow it in so you guys couldn't tell where it was. But <laughs> he put that lick tub in a spot where he could do what? Check it from the road. Check it from the road. And where else? Easy access. Easy access. Okay, so he, I mean, that's basically where he can drive to and throw it out, all right? So it's really doing nothing for livestock distribution. Does that look like a spot that the cattle would already want to be in? A flat spot with grass? Yeah. yeah. I mean, a flat spot with grass near water, they're going to they're gonna want to be there anyways, okay? So here's a different scenario, all right? So I'm sure you guys can't see it now, but... There are, there's another kind of, this is a whole different place. There's a lick, but I took this picture too. So there's a lick tub right there. So tell me about the differences there. And I'm gonna prove, so there's cattle there, all right? So does that look like a place that a cow would normally go to, climb up a steep hill, right? No. They're there because of the lick tub, all right? Yeah. So this is getting back to my I mean, I like this idea for range management, grazing management in general, but when we're talking about drought years and you're trying to get all the feed out of a pasture that you can without overgrazing, there's going to be places they don't want to go, right? And that's a spot right there where they don't want to go, but when they have something like those water or these uh, molasses protein tubs, are probably, I mean, besides a fence, those are probably two of your strongest ways to affect livestock distribution, is water or these things. But this takes a lot of effort to get these, these ones in this scenario up to this spot. So I'm almost, to, so on this allotment here, and I just took this picture last week, I'm, I'm, I'm almost up to the top here, not quite. But in this scenario, there's a highway down here, okay, and flat spots, and most of the water is down there too. And even in, during non-drought years, there's been some concern about the cattle concentrating around here. So I took this picture showing you know, what we're doing, what this permittee is doing, working with his rangeland management specialist to affect distribution. And in this case, we're absolutely extending our grazing season by affecting livestock distribution, okay? So think this is not gonna work in every place, everywhere. But are there other tools that will work 
for you on your place to affect livestock distribution? Yes, sir. What do you do about the balance of you put the mineral out those areas and they're just not traveling there, so then you're not getting the mineral and you're not grazing. So where is that balance? If, if they if they're not going to those places, right? Yeah. The stuff just sits there and they're not. Right. Okay. So there's got to be that middle ground, and in this scenario, this permittee is actively working with his cattle to show them where those things are. And you've got to use a, 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 a supplement that is attractive enough to them that they'll work for it. So I don't think salt is nearly as powerful as it, as it is sometimes touted to be. And it also depends on your country. If you're in a country that has a high salt content in the brows especially, it, it's not going to work very well at all. But those molasses lick tubs, I mean, I like them because they're easy to put out. All the cattle can get a portion of them. But what I really like about them is they really like them, and they will draw cattle to places that, that normally they don't go. But you've got to use them in the right way. So if you put a lick tub out and it's in a place where they're just not going to go, you're, you know, you're defeating yourself. But I think you'd be surprised at where you can get them to go if you work with your cattle and, and showing them where they are. And so a lot of cases, if you're going to be moving cattle into a spot that you want them to go that they typically don't go, you need to already have those things in place so that when they get there, it's you know they've already they've already found it. Um, this 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 a lot this grazing allotment here because of the terrain and because the this permittee on here is a new permittee. He's only been on here since spring of 2019, but the previous permittees, at least for at least I mean for maybe 20 30 years, never really did anything other than throw a few cows out. They ate out the box. I mean there's residual feed up there, not just from 2019, but several years be, uh, before that. Okay, so yeah, so I was just kind of showing where they used to go to where they um, are now, or where they're using now. So a couple of things that I want you to, to think about um, there is a tendency to really think about utilization and residual forage as, a, as the objective itself. So when we're out there monitoring on our plants, monitoring our rangelands, it's, you know, you hear it frequently, well, I've used 50%, so it's automatic, I need to go. Or I've got five inches of stubble, it's automatic, I need to go. So the, the, what concerns me about that is that that, man, that um, standard, that residual height standard or utilization level standard becomes the objective itself. What I want your objectives to be, though the, the utilization levels or the residual forage can be a tool to help us work towards an objective, but the objective, instead of a five inch double height or 50% use, the objective needs to be something more like, I'm seeing an increase of perennial grass species. I'm seeing a decrease in bare soil. I'm seeing a decrease in invasive plant species. Or I'm seeing a decrease in erosion in the riparian area. Or I'm seeing an increase of my cattle grazing the steep slopes or the places that are far from water. Not so much, I'm gonna to get to 50%, as long as I get to 50%, I'm good, I'm gone, I'm done. That becomes an, this arbitrary standard that is not appropriate for rangeland management. Um, it's not just me saying this, it's kind of one of my soapboxes lately, but if you're looking here, if you're reading some of that, and I hate putting this much text up on a slide, but, um, they shouldn't be the objectives themselves. They should be part of the tools that are used for overall management. If you're interested in reading more about this, um, do an internet search of this, right? In fact, you could just type in uh, SRM for Society for Range Management and look at utilization and residual feeds. There'll be a public in it. After, after this session, if you'd like, I can help you pull it up. It's a great technical note that was done in 2018. 
The funny or sad thing about this is that the Society for Range Management published a very similar document in 1998. So they did it in 1998, they did it again in 2018, it's because it's still being used, the utilization and residual forages are still being used inappropriately by ranchers, by federal agencies, um, as the objectives themselves. And I'm starting to have conversations with uh, um, range staff about this, so I wanted to mention it. So if those aren't going to be the standard, or if those aren't going to be the overall objective, what should the overall objective be? And it needs to be adaptive management, okay? So we want to have specific long-term goals. This is going to help get us away from the utilization or residual forage being the standard itself. So instead of, I want to see 50% use this year, it's going to be some of those other things I talked about. I want to see less bare ground. I want to see more perennial grass, less invasive species. There's probably some others that you would have on your place. Um, when we're using those short-term data, like utilization and residual forage, they need to be relevant to our overall goals. So like if I'm, and this is one that's specifically mentioned in that publication, if I'm worried, let's say I'm worried about erosion in a riparian area during spring runoff, okay? How big of a deal is stubble height in September if I'm worried about erosion in May and June? Like it's not even a, and it almost doesn't matter, right? So think in terms of, if you're using this short term, like think of it in terms of data that are goals that are relevant. And a lot of times we use these short term uh, monitoring methods or goals in replace of long-term trend data. And so long-term trend data can be as, as simple as taking photographs. And there's other methods as well. If you're, if you're grazing on a, on a federal permit, you really need to work with your rangeland management specialist on, on figuring out what kind of data you're gonna be taking. Um, cooperation with all parties. And so that gets back again to those meetings, those frustrating meetings sometimes, but you really need to get on out in front of the um, storm, and, and in this case, the no storm. You need to get out in front of it and start planning. And then really looking at the timing of grazing and the, the season of use. If you're grazing in the spring, that adaptive management is gonna be a lot different than if you're grazing, if you're, we're talking about you know February, January grazing, or even July and August grazing as well. And it's going to also depend on the elevation for the permit you're grazing on. So I want to show, this is one of my favorite pictures that I've ever taken. Um, so this is, this is at uh, grazing lands, and I took, this is, these two dirt clods are separated for, by an electric fence, okay? So on one side, some more adaptive management was put into place. The other side is just continuous grazing with basically no management. And that's the one on the right, and then there's one on the left. And so you can see that when we're talking about adaptive management, we really need to think about what's going on underground, under the um, under the soil surface that we that we can't see. And you really want to have that um, biomass of roots under the ground. This is what's going to make your pastures more drought resilient. Is to have a root system like that on the left hand side. How do we get to that? Like what are the principles that we're gonna, that are gonna allow us to be there? Distribution. Okay, working on distribution, right? What do those plants need? They need time to grow. Need time to grow, okay. Moisture. Moisture, okay. Maybe some, yeah, organic matter, fertilizer, and in some scenarios, not everywhere, but in some scenarios, especially irrigated land can help. That's what's going to make you um, drought resilient. Um, there is a really great, I'm getting on to my next subject here, there's a really great poisonous plants presentation coming up, so I'm not going to get to too much in detail, but when we're talking about drought and reduced feed, you have really got to watch your poisonous plants, okay? This one is halogen, and then here's a, another one. Who, who wants to name that? Larkspur. Larkspur, perfect, okay? So I actually, this one on the right, I think I took that one in probably 2019 or 18. It was a really good year. 
But this one I took in the spring of 2020, last year, okay? So what is scary about this one is that it's coming up, you know, so early. There's other, there's other plants that are going to be, there's a few other toxic plants that come up early. And so you can see there's, in 2020, there was a lot of residual feed out there when this one started poking up. Um, in 2021, if we don't get um, some more moisture coming up, that could that could be the case. It could be the case where there's just those poisonous plants. So really watch your poisonous plants out there um, this spring, especially if we're in a drought. Larkspur is one that can be bad any year, but it, especially during a drought, it can be it can be bad because it's maybe one of the only things that's that's, that's growing out there. But I'm not going to get too much into that poisonous plants. Um, but, but I highly encourage you to go to the presentation later today. So I'm going to kind of wrap it up here now. What questions do you still have or arguments you want to make? <laughs> Keep those to yourself. <laughs> well, I guess you mentioned a little bit about stocking rates, but I mean, it, it seems like, uh, at least for my, my operation, uh, come uh, into March, April, since we're starting to tag already now, It'll, by looking at what's happening weather-wise, I can make some decisions. I mean, I can sell my, my late cows, and get out, you know. I think having some, uh, some flexibility and just some lower numbers, uh, not just for the summer range, but then coming back on your, your plates, because, uh, I mean, you didn't mention it, but obviously whenever there's a problem uh, drought problems where, where restrictions, where we have to go out later or come back earlier, that affects our uh, private ground, uh, uh, hay meadows and pastures. And we can't sit on cows uh, through May <laughs> too long. It just, it, everything affects everything and it just spirals down. So easing the, your numbers can, can help. And that, that's definitely a strategy that a lot of ranchers are using. And I would say if that's going to be one that you're going to employ, that that's even more critical that if you're going to be selling stock, that you are really watching those timing of those spring rains and the winter snowpack. Because what's going to happen if everyone starts flooding the market with cattle? And then you won't get a good price. Okay. The other thing to watch is that I'm not going to say that this is going to happen every year or even ever again, but there have been years when lots of smart people told everyone to feed all their lot or to sell all their livestock, and there were guys that didn't and bought expensive hay and made out, you know. So there are some economic tools, um, like a partial budget, um, that you might consider using in, when you're thinking about: Am I going to sell livestock or feed hay or or purchase alternate feeds? or purchase alternate pastures. Um, a lot of times it's, it's not quite as simple as selling livestock, although that is definitely a strategy that, that is used all the time. I'm just, and I'm not saying it's not a good strategy, I'm just saying that you should consider other strategies before just automatically um, deciding to sell off. But I think it is a good idea to have a, a flexible stocking scenario, and it's also a good idea to have in mind the animals that you will liquidate if that's the if if that's the plan that you that you move towards, yeah. those are good points. The supply side, the su if we're going into another drought, the supply of forage is going to be down, and you've got to figure out ways to, to get around it. We've talked about just about a few of those uh, this morning, and there's other strategies. You know, reducing the demand a lot of times goes with the supply. Yesterday in a talk, they were just discussing the values or disadvantages associated with using protein tubs or whatever. And if you are providing that, it sounded like yesterday, if you do use protein maybe earlier than you need to, they'll consume more feed. And with respect to getting to that 50% utilization, there was talk that if you do get protein, maybe when it's not necessary, they consume more forage. Um, can you yeah. On that? So I, I don't know what the talk was, but. Um, you know, when, they're, when their diet is a higher quality diet, and the other thing that will impact this in, in a good way usually is, is water quality. So along with, if they're getting a good protein, they can handle other uh, rougher diet, and they can consume more. 
If they're able to drink more water, and especially higher quality water, they're also going to eat more food. Um, so I am definitely not a fan of overfeeding protein, and I think that's a good point that you bring up, because I've seen protein, I'll just call them protein <laughs> salesmen, come in to some ranches in like an early fall, especially even during a good year, and start trying to sell these protein packs when you're really throwing money out the backside of the cows when, when you're buying them during those, those kinds of years. Or I've seen protein packs being used when very high quality hay was also being fed. So I would highly encourage you to test your feeds. We can even test your, your forages on your pastures to figure out when they're being when, when they need to be used. And then balance that with how you're going to feed them. Um, if you're in a scenario where you can, where you can feed, you know, if you, maybe you're a smaller uh, geographic area and, you, and a smaller number of cows and you have the ability to feed cake and all the cows can have their share of cake. Can you feed it once, once a day, twice a week, once a week, varying amounts to in, in affect your transportation and delivery costs. Um, in this scenario where I was talking about, I'm really talking about affecting you know, livestock distribution while also supplying them with their protein needs. But absolutely, you don't want to be overfeeding it. Protein is the most expensive part of a diet. And so if you're overfeeding it, or then you're, that just means you're wasting money. The way I took it was that if you are giving them protein, then they don't necessarily need it or consume more. If, so if, if you use it and you don't need to be using it necessarily or you know, whether they are in their lactation and then energy needs, if you're using it, they're going to consume more. So maybe it's worth making your feed last longer by not using it. Right. If, if, they're, not, if they're not requiring it, then you really want to watch what you're feeding, if you're feeding it at all, and probably you don't need to be. In these kind of scenarios, in a winter rangeland dormant feed, they're almost almost always going to be requiring some level of supplement. I, I meant more in the summer. Okay. Yeah, you want to watch it. You want to watch it in those years, too, or in those times of year, I'm sorry. Um, and But, yeah, if you – and a lot of times when we are wanting animals to use more of a lower-quality feed, you know, the, sometimes the old thought was, well, I'm going to starve them on this, starve them on this low-quality feed, where actually if you give them a little bit of a protein boost, then they're able – along with the with the point the point you're, you're mentioning what about body conditioning scoring you know we talk about reading the signs of the rain don't you need to be reading the signs of your cows to know what you should be doing and not doing yeah absolutely and those important times are you know going into calving and then also going into breeding and then are you using the strategy of am I comfortable pulling them down a little bit in body condition during the winter a little bit where they're still in a, in a good enough body condition during calving and right after for a couple months especially after calving but then especially when they're going into the breeding scenario they really need to be on that upward trend of body condition to breed up well All right but I'm, I mean more probably like in the middle of the summer going into uh, fall like when you're like how far do I stretch my cows on the range I mean you're looking at range condition but you also <laughs> should be looking at your yep. cows like yeah. Animal performance is a big deal during, especially during drought years. Although there, a lot of times during drought years, um, maybe not really bad droughts, maybe, maybe more of those mild droughts. But I've talked to a lot of ranchers that tell me they bring in some really nice calves and lambs in the fall during those somewhat drier years, and that might go back to you know moisture content in the feeds and those kind of things. So, you animal performance is always a critical part of as well, not just the range. Well, Alex said I think we're about done. I'll be around for a little while, though. If anyone has any more que questions or comments or needs some help finding um, those publications or, or something else. So thank you for coming. We have these evaluation forms. If you'd, if you'd be kind enough to fill those out and, and turn one in, I'd appreciate it. Thank you.